opening a treasure box and here we have the very fundamentals of groundwater hydraulics now what do you understand by groundwater this is a very simple question that might be if you ask even a child they would answer that might be it's like a treasure box behind uh, beneath the earth surface but exactly it is not a treasure box so we cannot understand groundwater as a kind of compartment which is filled with water beneath the ground if that turns out to be true how do we understand the circulation of water the water cycle and all the hydrological cycles that exist so definitely when we are talking about groundwater it is much beyond that and what it is is an example where we are talking about a mixture of soil and water so across the whole area it's like a continuum and this continuum focuses on a component which is mixed with water beneath the surface of the earth to understand this we have a very simple demonstration i have a flask here with some of the ice cubes that you can see what would happen when i start pouring water or let's say juice into it when i start pouring a juice in this cup of water it would start to fill up now let's say it it has ice cubes up to this level it would fill up at up to a certain level and then beyond it you would see certain ice cubes that would float on the top of it how does it actually happen so the region which is below the complete filling of the juice we can say is the saturated zone and the region above it is the unsaturated zone which we also call as the widow zone now this is the same example that we have understood in our groundwater hydraulics so what happens in the groundwater you have a surface layer that is there water when comes through rain or let's say if even if you are pouring a bucket full of water onto a ground what would happen the water would start to percolate down now as it would start to move down there would be a point below the groundwater surface which would be fully saturated that means it does not have further capacity to hold water beyond it but on the upper layers we can see that there would be unsaturated zone where you have water but it is still has capacity to get in more water and that is what is known as the unsaturated zone so simply explaining if we go back to the basics of science we can understand that the saturated zone is a zone where you have mixture of solid state and a liquid state which is Uh, let's say in the demonstration that we saw it was ice and juice in the ground water it is soil and water however in the upper layers of the soil which is the unsaturated zone or the widow zone we have three phases that is the solid liquid and the gaseous phase so solid is the soil liquid is the water in the ground water system and then you have the gaseous phase which is the air that is present within the spaces that is there so those are the three phases that we see now why this ground water is so important if we look all around us on this globe we have nearly uh, of the 100% water component that we are talking besides the land component we have nearly 97% of the water that is in the oceans so this 97% of the water is not usable for drinking purpose so what we are left for with is just 3% of fresh water but out of this 3% again nearly 2.14% is trapped in the ice caps in the polar areas so what remains technically which could be used for human consumption is that less than 1% of this nearly 98% is present in ground water and merely 2% in the lakes and the oceans and therefore we understand that this ground water hydraulics is a very very important aspect to understand so we already talked about the saturated and the unsaturated zone with the help of the uh, example and the demonstration of the cup and the ice cubes that we have seen now this unsaturated zone itself can be further subdivided into three categories so listen this carefully you have the saturated zone then you have the unsaturated zone 
saturated zone is a zone where you have no more capability where water could percolate in and it's fully saturated it's 100 percent to the capability or the ability of holding water that is there this unsaturated zone could be divided into three components the first is soil water zone the next is a intermediate zone and nearest to the saturated zone is the capillary fringe now why this capillary fringe is so important this capillary fringe is a unique region how do we understand this this region is just above the saturated zone as you can see but here the water that is present is due to the capillary forces that are there and that's one of the very important reasons that we say the water present in the capillary fringe which is saturated is above the water table or above the saturated zone because the water is being held through the capillary forces that are present here the soil water zone is the uppermost zone and this is the zone where we understand that you have soils uh, with the plant roots now plant roots have a kind of unique characteristic here because with the capability of water that is present into the soil these plants could survive now what would be happen if this soil becomes very very dry the forces which are holding the water are so great that they would allow the plant to access all the water and then you would have the soil that would dry off similarly we have a intermediate zone now as you can see this is a zone a transition zone between the soil water and the capillary fringe that is seen so this is a very fundamental categorization of the unsaturated zone which is present in three phases solid liquid and gaseous freeze the saturated has just two phases solid and liquid again a very very simple example now we are focusing on only the unsaturated box we forget about the saturated zone as of now we'll come up on to that a minute later the unsaturated zone i can further separate out the solid layer the liquid layer and the gaseous layer from this so i have the different volumes that are seen now once i separate the different volumes i have the volume of those as well as the mass of each of those so the mass of the solids the mass of the liquids and the mass of the gas similarly i have the volume of the solid the volume of the liquid and the volume of the gas that is present now when i have all this information i can have certain uh, formulas that could help me solve the basics so first is understanding porosity now porosity simply put is what porosity i can say is the amount of the volume of gases and the volume of water in the total volume that is present and typically we say it turns out to be 0.4 which is a kind of typical value that we see for porosity to help us understand i have a very simple example for you let me have a game with two balls football and a tennis ball so i have a cube that is there and this is tightly packed with all uniform sized footballs so i have all the uniform sized footballs that are there in this cube now i calculate the porosity then what i do is i replace this cube with tennis balls smaller in size but uniformly packed and i pack this cube again uniformly with this tennis balls what is the porosity now how do we calculate porosity in either cases in the first case porosity would be volume of the box minus the volume of the footballs divided by the volume of the box in the second case it be, it would be volume of the box minus the volume of the tennis balls divided by the volume of the box so volume of the box we already know it's side into side into side so it's a cube so you have i'm talking about an idealized structure so it's it's uniform okay so you have 
the side into side into side that we can see and you would have 4 by 3 pi r cube which is the volume for the footballs and the tennis balls and change the radius in either case and when I calculate the values interestingly what comes up is the same value for the porosity now might be some of you might think that when we are decreasing it in radius the porosity would increase or decrease and so on but nothing like that the porosity remains the same how does it matter? It means the same amount of porosity means same amount of water that is trapped between the spaces. So here the amount of water that is trapped between the empty space and here the amount of water that is trapped between the empty space would remain the same. And that's very very important to explain that porosity is not a function of the grain size. Very very important concept that most of the students are at a very high level not able to clarify those doubts. So here we have a very clear concept about porosity. Now coming on to the next concept but basically in the same example if I move further and I mix the footballs with the tennis balls what would happen within the footballs there would be small small tennis balls that would be seen and this would change the porosity and my porosity would decline because the empty spaces that are there are filled with smaller balls and therefore the pores that are present would be blocked and my porosity would decline. Very very important concept. The next is understanding the volumetric water content which is also defined by theta v. Now this is the ratio of the volume of the water divided by the total volume or I could say the volume of the water per bulk volume of the soil sample. So for the whole soil sample I'll take the volume and I'll take a proportion of the water that is present in that soil sample. Now this varies from zero we could say in a dry soil to n which is the saturated amount of soil where you have the highest porosity that is seen. So that's the range of the volumetric water content that could be seen. The next example that we would understand is the saturation ratio. Now this saturation ratio is the volume of the water divided by volume of the voids that is there. Now this volume of the voids how do we understand this volume of the voids would be the volume of the gas plus volume of the water. So what would happen in case of saturated soil there is no volume of the gas so it would be volume of the water divided by volume of the water and that turns out to be 1. So for the saturated soil the saturation ra ratio would be 1 however it would be less for the dry soil the next important thing that we understand is the bulk density ratio. Now what happens is I take a soil sample which has some moisture, I put it in an oven and I dry it. I remove all proportions of water, all content of water, the tracest amount of water that is present. And this is what is the dry bulk density. So dry bulk density is the mass of the solid that is present divided by the total volume. However, when I talk about the soil particle density, it is the mass of the solid divided by volume of the solid that is present. So in this case I ignore any other volume which is because of the water or because of the air. In the first case I include all the three volume that is present because of the solid liquid and gaseous phases that are there but in the second case which is the soil particle density I include only the volume of the soil that is there and that's very very important. So the typical value that we say for a dry bulk density is usually 1.66 grams per centimeter cube and for a solid uh, the soil particle density it's usually 2.66 grams per centimeter cube so here is a very general picture about that now this whole things would vary in case of saturated soil because in the case of saturated soil there is no component of the gas so wherever we are talking about the gaseous component those would be totally ruled out in this case and this is a very basic aspect of understanding the groundwater hydraulics the hydrogeology that we say uh, in the next lectures we would be focusing on Darcy's law a very very important concept in the direction and the amount of flow of groundwater. So stay tuned for many more lectures on groundwater analysis. Have a wonderful day ahead.